לכבוד הוא לי להציג את אורח הכנס, פרופסור תומאס ג'ורדש, מאוניברסיטת קליפורניה שבסן דייגו, אחד החוקרים המובילים בעולם בתחום האמבודימנט. משמע, בעולם הקורא למחקר והגות אנתרופולוגית וסוציולוגית, השמים לעצמם למטרה להתרחק מהדיכוטומיה שבין הגוף והרוח, להתרחק מהנטייה לקטע את איברי הגוף ולהמיר את אלו בהתייחסות למכלול האנושי ולגוף ולנפש כישות אחת שלא ניתנת לקיטוע. לאחר תקופה לא קצרה שבה אפיין את הניתוח בתחום מחקרי גוף, אוצר מילים מוגבל ביחס לאופנים בהם הגוף והסובייקטיביות טבועים יחד, פרופסור, פרופסור ג'ורדש לקח על עצמו לפתח את המושג התנסות מאורגנת גוף, או Embodied Experience, כנקודת מוצא אנליטית אפקטיבית בשדה. עבורו, משמעותה של ההתנסות מאורגנת בשדה היא שלהתנסויות הגוף שלנו, כפי שהן נחוות במפגש בין טכניתוק... טכניקות הגוף שלנו לבין התביעות של הסביבה מאיתנו, אם בטקסים דתיים ואם בהליכים מוסדיים, יש כוח מעצב. עמדה תאורטית אמיצה זו היא תגובה ראויה לגישה הפוסט-מודרניסטית שהייתה שלטת בתחום עד לאחרונה בעקבות עבודותיו של מייקל טרנר ואחרים, על פיהם הגוף הוא זירה של יחסי כוח בין כוחות חברתיים ופוליטיים ללא מיקום וכוח התמקמות המקדימים מאבקים אלו. עבור פמיניסטיות, התפיסה שלו היא חילוץ מאוד חשוב מהמגבלה של הפוסט-טרוקטורליזם והדיון שלהם במאבקי כוח בין שיחים. התנסויות הגוף מעבר לשיחים המכוננים אותם, במיוחד בהקשר של אונס, תקיפה, אלימות נגד נשים, לא נתונות למאבק פרשני, או נכון יותר, אסור שיהיו נתונות למאבק פרשני, ויש להעמיד אותן מחוץ לשאלת, לשאלה שמטילה ספק במרכיב האונתולוגי שלהם. ה-embodied experience שמגולם בהם הוא חשוב מעבר למאבקי הכוח הפוליטי. בספרו Embody, Embodiment and Experience, צ'ורדש משכלל את גישתו הפנומנולוגית לתרבות וממשיג את הגוף כמקור יוצרני וכבסיס קיומי של התרבות. זוהי המשגה היוצרת הסט מההדגשים המנטליסטיים שבהגדרת התרבות כגון סמל, מבנה או סכמה אל עבר מוקדים אחרים כמו חישה, אוריינטציה, מחווה ונוהג. גישת צ'ורדש היא מגשרת ביסודה אפילו גואלת. היא עושה פרובלמטיזציה של הבחנות העלולות לטענתו להביא לכשל בהבנת האדם. הכוונה להבחנות בין סובייקט לאובייקט, בין ייצוג לבין היות בעולם, שגם האנתרופולוגיה לוקה בהן ככל שהיא מעדיפה את הסמיוטיקה על פני הפנומנולוגיה. בכך למשל, הוא סותר את אמונתנו הרווחת לפיה החוויה איננה ניתנת לתיאור במילים, וגם מציע בהשראת בורדיה לראות ברגשות שבמסגרת ריטואלים דתיים ו-orchestrated dispositions. לאחרונה, פרופסור ג'ו צ'ורדש משמש אחד משני חוקרים ראשיים בפרויקט מקיף הבוחן את חוויותיהם של מתבגרים בזיקה לטיפול פסיכיאטרי ואשפוז. מתבגרים שמוצאם קהילות אמריקניות מודרות ועניות הנגועות באלימות וסמים, חושפים חוויה אמריקאית שיש לה הדהוד גם בישראל. גם בישראל נדרשת לנו גישתו המאורגנת בהתנסויות הגוף וברגשות המלווים אותן. לאחרונה היו לנו שלושה מקרים של נשים קורבנות אינססט עם PTSD שהתאבדו במהלך האשפוז הפסיכיאטרי שלהן, או מיד לאחר מכן. קבוצת בני נוער הקימה דף פייסבוק שבו מחו נגד חוויות האשפוז הפסיכיאטרי הקשות שעברו במספר מחלקות. בעמוד הפייסבוק הם תיארו את אין ספור הדרכים בהן התנסויות המוגנ... סליחה, התנסויות מעוגנות הגוף שלהן במהלך האשפוז גרמו להן לטראומה והאיצו את הידרדרותם הנפשית. לדוגמה, נער אחד סיפר כיצד הפסיכיאטרית שלו הבטיחה לשחרר אותו עם מאות לעבור טיפול מול כיתת הסטודנטים שלה. 
נערה תיארה כיצד הותקפה מינית במחלקה כשאף אחד מחברי הצוות הרפואי לא לקח על עצמו להגן עליה. התנסויות מעוגנות גוף קשות אלו הופכות לאירועים רגשיים חזקים ביותר העומדים מעבר לכל שאלה על כינון שיחי של הגוף. אני מזמינה את פרופסור צ'ורדש להציג את דבריו ואני בטוחה שרעיונותיו המקוריים והדרושים ביותר יאירו את הדינמיקות האלו ויציידו את כולנו במבט ביקורתי ביחס לשירותים הפסיכיאטריים וחשוב מכך ביחס להגות העכשווית בחקר הגוף. אני שמחה להזמין את פרופסור ג'ורדש לדבר על Psychological Anthropology at the Frontier of Experience and Subjectivity. בבקשה פרופסור ג'ורדש. Thank you for that marvelous introduction. I want to thank Tova also for inviting me to this wonderful event. Shalom and happy Hanukkah to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here to celebrate with you the inauguration of psychological anthropology in Israel. But as it happens, and without explicit planning, my presence today is itself a political act as well as an academic one. I refer to last month's vote at the annual meeting of the American Anthropological Association in which a resolution to boycott Israeli universities was approved by 1,040 to 136. This crisis, this academic crisis, may not be as palpable or as urgent for our sociology colleagues but for me to remain silent under these circumstances would be as much of a political act as to speak. And I speak as an invited representative of psychological anthropology, which is a field that began in the United States. And I speak as a citizen of a country that contributes immense amounts of money to this country. I categorically reject as profoundly misguided the idea of a boycott of academic institutions. In favor of in favor of supporting you, the anthropological colleagues who are best positioned as university professors to contribute to the understanding of what makes us different and what makes us the same, and to help teach young people as well as fellow citizens the values of diversity and tolerance. Likewise, I reject the commonly asserted analogy to apartheid as misleading and provocative, because the more important distinction is that South African blacks were denied inclusion while Palestinians are denied autonomy. At the same time, the circumstances of this moment compel me to affirm some points of agreement with the motives of the boycott. A stand that the Israeli occupation of Palestine is wrong, that the wall of, that the wall of separation is more a monument of shame than it is a guarantor of security, and my country I will note, also has such a shameful wall on its southern border for the extensive purpose of security. One difference being that our wall is entirely on our side of the border. And finally, that residential settlements and academic institutions in occupied territory are both destructive and self-destructive. But after all, this is about politics. And in that light, I quote the words of the renowned Jewish-American cultural critic, Julius Henry Marx, who said, politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. <laughs> With respect to the hopefully less fraught future of psychological anthropology, an occasion such as this allows for, and even requires, a restatement of the obvious perhaps with a bit of a twist, and I want to begin with a brief rehearsal of what I understand to be the five areas of inquiry that constitute psychological anthropology. I'll call these the individual, the processual, the developmental, the pathological, and the phenomenological. First, the individual area includes questions pertaining to the nature of self, identity, person, and personality in relation to others in the social world. My understanding of self is as a configuration of orientational processes, including orientation towards one's own being, to others, and to the world. 
The intent of this definition is to be useful for broad comparative purposes and to avoid the dilemma of restricting the self either to a bounded entity or to a diffuse collection of contextually specific and socially determined individuals, as McKim Marriott once referred to the self in India. Second, the processual area includes a study of psychological processes, such as motivation, cognition, perception, learning, and memory in relation to behavior and social action. This is where psychological anthropology is closest to cross-cultural psychology, cultural psychology, or social psychology. It includes cognitive anthropology, which lies adjacent to the related fields of cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience. Cognitive approaches are valuable, except when they become overambitious with claims to offer a comprehensive account of culture, insofar as an exclusive attempt to understand culture from the neck up requires attention to embodiment and bodily experience as a necessary corrective. Third, the development area has to do with issues of socialization, enculturation, language acquisition, and stages of the life cycle. This is an area in which I've never claimed much expertise or even interest, but found myself drawn in circumstantially, insofar as enough of the participants in the Navajo Healing Project were youth who deserved being understood as a group. And the Catholic Charismatic Intentional community I studied persisted into a second generation whose youth deserved to be studied. And a specialized psychiatric unit for Navajo youth opened that combined indigenous and conventional treatment and well-warranted study. I only mention these serendipitous studies in contrast to a work of a social anthropologist colleague whose studies emphasized the social and symbolic importance of children in a New Guinea society, but who never took the time to talk to any children. In my case, these circumstances led me toward an examination of identity formation and biographical coherence in a way that may never have occurred without a grounding in and commitment to psychological anthropology. Fourth is the pathological area, the interface of psychiatry and anthropology in psychological anthropology, and the point at which psychoanalysis becomes a critical methodology. It is the empirical site for analysis of diagnostic categories with respect to cultural factors determining the nature of psychic distress caused by conflict, trauma, or endogenous factors as well as the course and outcome of psychiatric disorder. It is also the prime empirical site of the psychotherapy analogy in which therapeutic process in conventional treatment is posited as the equivalent of ritual process in religious healing and becomes a central focus of ethnographic research. Finally, the phenomenological area has to do explicitly with experience and subjectivity. Experience is the immediacy of perception in the world, always to be understood with respect to temporality and the cultural constitution of reality. Subjectivity is the relatively perduring but malleable structure of experience, always to be understood as inseparable from intersubjectivity via the co-presence of others. <laughs> the explicit engagement with phenomenology is the newest of the areas within psychological anthropology, though it has implicitly been with us at least as long as A.I. Hallowell used the phrase phenomenology for want of a better term, as he said. The turn toward experience has been a corrective to an overly textualized, discursive, and symbolic approach in anthropology, and in my view has benefited significantly from the elaboration of embodiment as a phenomenologically inspired methodological stance in our field. All five of these areas are critical, but with respect to psychological anthropology in the 21st century, the first challenge I would pose to Israeli colleagues is to cultivate our subfield's distinctive contribution of augmenting anthropology with a deep empirical appreciation of experience. There was a time when psychological anthropology was accused of reductionism, but our work has never reduced the social and cultural to the psychological. On the contrary, we lay the ethnographic groundwork the same as other anthropologists, but go a step further. By engaging experience, we provide a surplus, something extra that's not always taken into account in anthropology. In this critical respect, psychological anthropology is not a reduction, it's an augmentation. 
In recent years, this has become increasingly evident in a way distinct from earlier formulations of culture and personality, individual and society, or micro and macro approaches, with an analytic sensibility emphasizing connections between subjectivity as the structured experience of social actors and the global social conditions under which that subjectivity takes form. I can give a very brief example of this relation among experience, subjectivity, and social conditions from the work of Elisa Farinacci, a graduate student at the University of Bologna who served as my research assistant in Italy and whose own dissertation research occurred not terribly far from here in Bethlehem. For those living in its immediate proximity, the wall of separation is a looming oppressive presence, an inescapable element of immediate experience. For those who live far enough away so that it is out of sight, life goes on as if it did not exist. Yet while it may not be a feature of experience in everyday life, it is an element of subjectivity that contributes to the structure of experience. It is most certainly both a concrete instantiation and a powerful symbol of global geopoli geopolitics as well, and perhaps also represents a collective psychodynamic conflict between insecurity and arrogance. In this respect, it is a psychic leg legacy of Judeo-Christian civilization to the extent that any of us has been formed by it. The second challenge is to document the greatest range of diversity possible and then begin looking for commonalities. This means being able to conduct research and send students to conduct research in as wide a distribution of the world's cultures as possible. The days of national schools of anthropology that focus only on their own societies have long been over, and the global understanding of diversity is the only viable way of proceeding. This documentation of diversity on a global scale is the greatest contribution you as Israeli anthropologists can make in terms of creating a basis for seeing the Palestinians on the other side of the wall as less other and more similar than they have in the past. The third challenge is to promote the distinct scholarly ethos of our small field that has been able to avoid the divisiveness of science wars, insofar as we insist that there is no incommensurability between counting like scientists and interpreting like humanists. Human nature has a double meaning. It can refer to an existential understanding of what kind of beings we are, of what it's like and what it means to be human, or it can accentuate nature as a matter of heredity, evolution, and biology. The first poses a problem of interpretation and the meaning of human experience, while the second poses a problem of explanation, accentuating the causal mechanisms that make and have made us humans. I want to turn now to a brief presentation of two projects on which I've been working as examples of research in psychological anthropology in the 21st century. The first is a study of adolescent psychiatric inpatients in the southwestern United States state of New Mexico. And the second is a comparative study of Roman Catholic exorcism in Italy and the United States. I'll focus on elements of these projects that best illustrate the kind of phenomenological approach that I mentioned is relatively new in psychological anthropology. The first is called Southwest Youth and the Experience of Psychiatric Treatment. I'll refer to it by its acronym, SWIAT. It took place in the state of New Mexico in the southwest of the United States and was based in the Children's Psychiatric Hospital at the University of New Mexico Medical School. From there, we were able to recruit 47 adolescents aged 12 to 18 and a key parent of each to participate in our study. New Mexico is one of the poorest states in the nation, where as of, eight, as of the year 2008, the median household income was the 44th lowest among the 50 states, and the proportions of people living below the poverty level was fifth among the states. Along with poverty comes a serious drug problem, with parts of the state severely afflicted by heroin and methamphetamine use, and the presence of violent gangs where one website listed 178 different gangs in Albuquerque, the one large city in New Mexico. The intent of our study was to develop an understanding of patient and family experience, um, not only while they were hospitalized, but over time and across settings, 
as an element of their developmental trajectory, course of illness, and transformation of how they interpreted their situations. In order to do this, we conducted ethnographic interviews and observations in their homes and other institutions in which they might be placed, and conducted the structured clinical interview for DSM, which allowed us to determine whether they, their problems could in fact be defined as psychopathology uh, in relation to psychiatric diagnostic criteria. The diagnostic and ethnographic interviews yield different but complementary forms of knowledge. Thus, from the skid, we found that common diagnoses included de depressive disorders, anxiety and panic disorder, substance abuse, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, PTSD, psychosis, bipolar disorder, and eating disorders, often more than one of these at a time. Our ethnographic interviews uncovered a diverse set of adverse life experiences, including perpetration of violence by the young person, suicide attempts, trouble with the police or legal system, bereavement of, from, of the relatives, death of relatives, trouble with drugs or alcohol, episodes of self-cutting, being the victim of physical or sexual abuse, and again, often more than one of these. Either of these sets of categories, the diagnostic or the life experience categories, could provide a useful means for organizing our understanding of the experience of these young people. However, as we began to work through our material, it became compellingly evident that anger is an experiential theme and an explicit problem that cross-cuts both sets of categories. Indeed, anger was specifically cited by 57% of our participants. And indeed, there's a distinct vocabulary of anger that can be extracted from the discourse of the SWIAPT participants and their families. Hence, my focus today on the following research question. What is the meaning of anger in the experience of the adolescent psychiatric inpatients with whom we've been working? Let me back up to a consideration of how psychological anthropology as a field approaches anger. Consider two widely known anthropological instances of anger in cultural context. The first is in Jean Briggs' book, Never in Anger, with claims that from a very early age, the Inuit are instilled with an aversion not only to expressing anger, but also to experiencing it. This is quite understandable in a small-scale society of sometimes forced intimacy, where slamming the metaphorical igloo door and stocking off into a frigid arctic night is conducive neither to cultural nor to personal survival. The second is Renato Rizzaldo's book, Grief and the Headhunter's Rage, in which following his own experience of bereavement, the anthropologist comes to empathetically grasp how among the Ilongot, bereavement incites a rage that can only be appropriately, appropriately assuaged by violently taking the head of another person. Both are accounts of unfamiliar yet eminently intelligible instances of the meaning of anger in highly particularized cultural contexts. The moral valence of anger in the Inuit case is generally that it is wrong negatively sanctioned, at least in the sense that it is socially dangerous. The moral valence of anger in the Elongat case is that in certain circumstances it is not only right, but entails an obligation to act in a certain way. The anger that I'm outlining here is radically different and poses a different kind of challenge to ethnographic understanding. This is because among SWIAPT participants, biographical coherence, personal identity, consistency of social environment and stability of life trajectory are urgently at stake in a manner virtually inconceivable among the Inuit or Alangat. Anger is not only an unstable category in the face of interpretation, but a destabilizing force in the social milieu of such persons. It is an anger that demands interpretation along the axis of the normal and the pathological, and specifically with an appreciation of the relation between emotion and psychopathology in cultural context, as demonstrated, for example, in anger and hostility among Mexican and Anglo-American families affected by schizophrenia, or the engaged depression and somatic experience of heat, calor, among Salvadoran women refugees, studied by Janice Jenkins. 
While this approach does not discount the value of diagnostic interpretation from a clinical standpoint, it takes a step backward to problematize the distinction between normal and pathological by situating emotion, in the present case anger, in the life world of patients and families. This is achieved by beginning with concrete accounts of the experience of anger and its place in the configuration of family relationships. I'll briefly introduce to you one angry boy and one angry girl from our study, and then conclude this section with some general comments on an understanding anger as a moral emotion in this context. We met Luke when he was 15 years old and in ninth grade at his local high school. He lives in a low-income neighborhood outside Albuquerque with his mother, two younger sisters, and brother, all of whom have different biological fathers. Luke has received outpatient psychiatric treatment since he was in kindergarten, diagnosed at the time with ADHD, for which he was prescribed medication. Since that time, he has had seven inpatient hospitalizations for episodes of explosive anger and has been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. The hospitalization during which we encountered him occurred in the wake of a physical fight with his sister, for which Luke's mother called the police, who offered either to arrest him or take him for psychiatric hospitalization. Asked what he thought of his hospitalization, he, was, he said he was there for, and I quote, anger, mostly my anger. I have big erratic blow-ups. I go from flat line to straight up. He's unwavering, however, in his conviction that his problem started with the trauma inflicted upon him and his sisters by their stepfather. Luke recalled that for seven years I thought I loved him as my father. Thus it was crushing to him to have his sisters divulge that for a period of approximately four years his stepfather had sexually abused them while their mother worked long and late shifts at night. Moreover, his stepfather was a severe disciplinarian who beat Luke and handcuffed him to his bed to allow for opportunities to abuse his sisters without his interference. Luke reports struggling with the handcuffs, breaking some of the bars on his bed, which led the stepfather to cuff him to one of the thicker and sturdier bars instead. Following his, revelations, uh, following his sister's revelations of sexual abuse, Luke demanded that they tell his mother because he refused to keep such a terrible secret. In the wake of that telling, the stepfather was arrested and held in custody, pending a trial that particularly preoccupied Luke at the time we met him. Luke met the lack of protection from his mother with the creation of a self-system in which anger is readily and reliably available. His anger protects him even if his mother and her various boyfriends will not. Yet without the capacity for self-control of anger, the social determinant of Luke's life, Luke's life is the revolving door of the hospital, foster home, and family home. Luke fully recognizes this, yet remains deeply conflicted. Ang angry blow-ups cost him his freedom and residential stability, but letting go of anger leaves him empty-handed and undefended. Louisa, our angry girl, was 16 years old and a high school junior when she began participating in the Swiat project. Living with her mother, 20-year-old brother, and 14-year-old sister in a town of about 14,000 people, in northern New Mexico. Louisa's mother is obese with health problems, a smoker who uses an oxygen tank, and is without most of her teeth due to previous cocaine use. The mother and daughter are close to the point of emotional enmeshment, considering one another as best friends, and Louisa is exceedingly concerned with the state of her mother's health. At the same time, her mother claims that her own health is impaired by Louisa's explosive anger, insofar as she cannot, as she says, cannot physically take her shit, but cannot get away from Louisa because of her own physical problems. In fact, Louisa appears to be the healthiest member of her family, with the burden of attending to the other's needs, since her brother is labeled psychotic and her sister autistic. In fact, the family income consists entirely of disability payments from the government. The hospitalization during which we encountered Louisa was her fourth since age 12, and the incident that led to her admission was a severe fight with her brother, during which he said he beat the shit out of her, hitting her harder than ever before and burning her with a cigarette as she fell on the floor and hit her head on the refrigerator. He then called the police himself, and an ambulance took her to an emergency room and from there to the psychiatric hospital in Albuquerque. The hospital was a positive environment for her. 
She referred to it as a vacation from home, and it appears to have functioned as a place of respite from the volatile family milieu and the stress of her mother's health problems. She claimed it helped her learn to control her anger, which following discharge she wanted to do without the assistance of therapy, though she continued to take medications. At the end of her participation in the project, Louisa had graduated high school and was planning to attend community college to become a mechanic, fixing automobiles. With these two young people in mind, let's consider the possible phenomenological variations in emotional tone of a domestic environment such as they might inhabit. An environment qualified by chronic episode, episodic and violent anger, where by qualified we mean endowed with a certain quality or valence. If we adopt the metaphor of emotional lightness and heaviness, the first variant is the household where the constant expression of anger or the persistent possibility for expression of anger creates a milieu that is heavy, intense, harsh, and on edge. The alternative is the environment in which, between episodes of disruptive anger, the environment returns to a relative light lightness or stability with equilibrium and perhaps even harmony tinged with sweetness. In the periods of relative calm, family members become vulnerable in a repeated and cyclical way, ever again hurt by the outbreak of violent rage. Contributing to this situation is the frequent tendency of the young person, within a day or even within an hour, to act like nothing has happened. The presumption of a return to normalcy and the desperation of family members for some degree of equilibrium can be quite compelling. This must certainly have a temporal component that further qualifies the domestic emotional tone. And so far as in some instances angry outbursts are like an everyday occurrence, and in others the outbursts may occur every other week. There is no reason to conclude, however, that increasing frequency necessarily results in the consistently heavy and harsh type of environment, since it's possible for family members to cycle between violence and vulnerability on relatively short periodicities. Both types of environment exhibit tendencies toward the normalization or taking for granted of anger. We can see this in the process that ensues between recognizing the crossing of a threshold between irritability and anger that marks the onset of a crisis through to its resolution or to a breaking point constituted by a call for intervention by police or the healthcare system. In some families, a parent, a parent can, as they say, see it in her face or sense a growing inner turmoil of a child. And in other cases, it appears to come out of the blue. In some families, both parents and children can pinpoint triggering events and reasons, either profoundly consequential or relatively trivial. And in other families, anger is reported to occur over the smallest thing or for no reason at all. Normalization is most evident and problematic in saying that the anger is typical adolescent behavior or growing pains in the context of not being certain of the boundary of such allegedly typical behavior. Such a statement appears to be less an attempt to excuse than to account for the behavior, and of course it would be a form of denial. Acknowledging that violent rage is mixed with typical behavior may only serve to enhance tolerance while exacerbating frustration and confusion. Even in the rare instance where a young person has the insight to characterize their own behavior as like that of other kids only carried to an extreme. What is at issue in each case is the threshold of this extreme, a threshold at the first level that defines emotional damage and that at a second level defines a breaking point that demands outside intervention. As odd as it may at first seem to describe circumstances characterized by sudden ruptures in terms of thresholds, it's most accurate to say that breaking points exist within a threshold of tolerance and endurance that may vary from time to time, mood to mood, with severity of affliction by the persons involved and by what is at stake. In some ways this is no surprise, and that even parents with children who are not severely distressed occasionally find themselves declaring, that's the last straw in exasperation, only to be surprised at how many straws actually yet remain. 
The interpretive problem of underpinning a discussion such as this with the distinction between normal and pathological is that they are mutually exclusive categories. And even if it is granted that there is either qualitative or quantitative continua between everyday anger and anger that requires treatment, there must be a threshold that ultimately keeps them apart. The same anger cannot be both normal and pathological at the same time. This leads us back to our parallel series of diagnostic categories and cat categories of life experience, which are not mutually exclusive because they're based on a different distinction. Not that between normal and pathological, but that between moral and pathological. Here our empirical observation that anger plays a central role in the world of adolescent mental health is reinforced on a conceptual level insofar as it belongs equally to both systems and in fact is a kind of phenomenological pivot between them. Anger is simultaneously a symptom in the domain of psychopathology and an emotion in the domain of life experience, and in the latter it is precisely a moral emotion. This dual interpretive frame avoids the convenient fiction of intelligibility interpolated into the life world by diagnostic categories such as oppositional defiant disorder and intermittent explosive disorder, which provide labels um, only for accounts of anger, but by no means explain it, except in a spurious way that presumes that if something can be called a disorder, it is fundamentally biological in nature, and hence largely beyond the sphere of either the moral or the cultural. The argument is not only that our patient's anger is sometimes pathological and sometimes normal, as critical to our understanding as that may be, it is also that the aspects of pathological symptom and moral emotion are mutually implicated and closely intertwined in constituting anger as a prominent aspect of their experience. To understand anger as a moral emotion in a situa situation characterized by psychopathology requires a further step toward taking account of needs and rights faced with an institutional structure, the evaluation of interpersonal relations, and expressive repertoire of affect. Anger is moral insofar as it is a response to offense, harm, violence, injustice, insult, damage, cruelty, or abuse. As was the case with many SWIAP participants, the two young people we've discussed have specific issues or events about which to be angry. In such a situation, pathology might consist simply in an incapacity to hang handle the depth of an anger that is quite appropriate. Anger beyond propriety is not a homogeneous category, however, but can exhibit a range of phenomenological modulations. Thus it can occur with unusual frequency or intensity, can be directed at inappropriate targets or situations, and can take the form of an almost permanent disposition. Even when disproportionate anger is provoked by the seemingly trivial, however, it does not entirely lose its moral character. In the end, success in addressing the question we've posed for ourselves, the meaning of anger among troubled adolescents with whom we've been working, requires us not just to ask what they're angry about, but to determine what there is to be angry about, what the anger feels like, what are its modes of expression, and what these modes of expression disclose about the structure and quality of experience. We've come a long way from the Inuit and Ilongot, but there is much more yet to be said about the angry adolescence in the land of enchantment. The second study I want to describe briefly is called Hammering the Devil with Prayer, Contemporary Exorcism in the Roman Catholic Church. I formulated this study after observing that in the past ten years, exorcism was a resurgent ritual practice among Roman Catholics. I've undertaken a comparative study of this practice in the United States and Italy, working with the exorcists themselves, with the psychiatrists and other mental health professionals who consult with them, the lay people who assist them, and the afflicted people they attempt to help. Catholic exorcism is a liturgical prayer in which the aim is relief from affliction of people possessed by demonic <coughs> spirits, performed by an ordained priest under auspices of his local bishop. The idea that people can be controlled or possessed by beings without bodies whether they are disembodied spirits, never embodied deities, or divinity incarnate, and whether they are malevolent, benevolent, or a combination of both, is widespread among the world's cultures and religions. 
In some instances, people may feel the need to rid themselves of these beings, in which case they develop rituals of exorcism to achieve that goal. In other instances, they determine the need to accommodate to and develop ongoing relationships with these beings, in which case they develop practices of adorcism, a term coined by an anthropologist to serve as the opposite of exorcism. Catholic exorcism prayer has been in resurgence since the beginning of the 21st century and is probably more prominent now than at any time since the 1600s, two periods separated by the Enlightenment and its aftermath. Some say this is because people have drifted away from God and toward the devil in the form of occult practices, defined broadly from checking one's horoscope in the daily newspaper to overt Satanism. Others say the need has always been there, it's just that the church is paying attention in a way that it hasn't for a long time. Although one might presume that any action on the part of beings without bodies must, by definition, be classified as extraordinary, such is not the case in the practice of Roman Catholic exorcism. In fact, diabolical spirits are understood to act in an ordinary way in the form of temptation to sin and in extraordinary ways when they afflict people in the form of obsession or possession. The prayers that constitute the formal rite of exorcism are only used when it's determined that the degree of demonic affliction is severe enough to be called possession. The exorcist must be performed by a priest with the authorization of his local bishop, and in contemporary practice is usually not undertaken without consultation from a mental health professional. Because time is limited, I will briefly present just one instance from Italy in which bodily experience is particularly salient. This is the instance of a divorced woman, about 50 years of age, living in an urban area of Italy and who was a university graduate with professional training. She had been undergoing sessions of exorcism for more than seven years, first with a monk who visited her at her home, then for five years with the priest to whom she was referred by the curia after review and consideration of her case. She had been leading a secular life and struggled with skepticism about God and evil spirits, but had found no adequate help elsewhere. The priest who had been conducting the rite resided in a seminary in a major urban area, where he also engaged in the training of priests. He noted that she was not yet fully liberated, but that the grasp of the devil had diminished. In this case, over time, several demons had been identified, led by one named Militia Tamiel. In this excerpt, the woman describes her bodily experience as follows. And this is translated from the Italian. Militia Tamiel, it was the devil who ruled it. And then we placed seven demons. This militia then, the militia on the heart, the chest, one on the throat, one on the head and neck, one on the stomach, another in the genitals, and another was Beelzebub in the back, then one in the pelvis and in the leg, okay? And this was done because they had identified, because I named them when he performed the exorcism, I named them one by one, and I felt pain, understand? And he was able to make a map, depending on how I responded physically, and I have to say the physical reactions and noises, depending on the demons that I named, were absolutely different one from the other things that I did not tolerate. There were cries that I just could not stand. These are cries coming from herself. Awful. And then, of course, the physical situations in which two people had to hold me down. In the midst of all of this, it is clear that I was asked by Don Chesa to start attending church and the sacraments again. The church meaning attending mass and praying. I have to say that thanks to the first priest who brought me the image of Our Lady of Medjugorje, that he had used during exorcisms and gave to me, I started to have a connection, and through this image I began to talk, to narrate myself, to pray, until it had become, how can I say, a kind of mother on whom to rely, a mother that was not my own. In this instance, the afflicted woman's body is a terrain of demonic activity as the process constructs a map of interconnected points of demonic influence within her body. I've referred to her experience in interviews uh, with a number of other exorcists, particularly to inquire about whether the bodily sites to which she refers might not correspond to what in Hindu thought are identified as chakras. The clearest answer was that these are important points in one's body regardless of whether they are called chakras. Though within the logic of Catholic exorcism, it might also be relevant 
that her previous interest in Eastern spirituality had predisposed her to experience her own body in this way or to make these sites more vulnerable to demonic attack. The bodiliness of her experience also vividly includes classic demonic manifestations of vocalization and physical struggle, and in the process of recovery, engagement with the mass, sacraments, and prayer assisted by the physical image of the Virgin in her apparition of Nigeria. The question of beings without bodies is an ontological one, a question about what exists and how it exists. Theology asks about what exists supernaturally and hence is a matter of faith. Anthropology asks about what exists as a cultural phenomenon and hence is a matter of experience. I have found it useful to approach experience from the standpoint of embodiment, the fact of having and being a body in its aspects of corporality, animality, and materiality. Insofar as embodiment is our fundamental existential condition, it's a valuable starting point for phenomenological analysis. It allows us to grasp, for example, what some people describe as an out-of-body experience as itself a particular kind of bodily experience. It allows us to grasp, as I've argued in other venues, that the fundamental alterity of our own bodies, in the sense that we can feel alienated from ourselves or feel as if we are objects to ourselves, is a phenomenological kernel of religion. Empirically, my focus here has been anthropological in this sense of a cultural phenomenology of embodiment, examining how both uh, demonic manifestations emerge in bodily experience and how prayer is itself a bodily practice. Evidently, there's more to be done to flesh out the skeleton of an art argument such as this. But embarking from this <coughs> vignette, I can suggest that the question of interest is not so much what the experience of extraordinary action says about the beings without bodies, but what it says about our own bodies and our existence as bodily <coughs> beings. There is something more that must be said about this woman's experience, however, because from the beginning, there was no, she was never completely convinced that her problem was demonic. In her words, I'll tell you what I said to myself at the beginning. This is not the devil, these are your personal hells that are activated in this situation, as they come out, maybe through this situation, and all situations sacred, and maybe they're the outcome of your personal hells. I just thought that they were manifestations that came out of my head and my stomach, that I was pulling out something that I had created a conflict, and so on, but I could not control it. She went through the ritual process, including intense episodes in which the demons threw her into physical struggles that required restraint by others, spontaneous vocalizations and screams that she could not control, and inability to touch the consecrated host in communion. The exorcist identified seven demons which he cast out and instructed her to start attending church and the sacraments again. She found some measure of peace, and as time passed, her sessions became less traumatic, but again, in her words, I continued to have this conflict. I realized that to fully adhere to this thing, I would have to do a partial suicide of my intelligence, of my beliefs, because the act of faith implies that I do not know if I did it completely. I prayed a lot. I prayed a lot through the Virgin Mary, the image of the Virgin Mary. I was even to sp speak to Jesus again, which was something that I hadn't been able to do. I remember one day I said, Lord, if you're watching me and everything that happens to me, turn away from me your merciful gaze. To be brief, the act of abandonment to divine mercy for this woman equated the leap of faith to a form of intellectual suicide that abdicated her own education, training, and rationality. I'll be very brief in summarizing the implications of this woman's situation. Specifically, it allows for recognition of her authentic suffering and the sincere attempts of exorcists to alleviate it. However, it is also the case that when men are possessed, their agency is likewise diminished, and it remains for further analysis in their cases whether the modulations of agency are gendered in particular and specific ways. Another observation stems from a phrase used in French anthropological studies on the general subject of spirit possession namely that of the crise de possession. For many years I translated this simply as episode of possession, but in examining the cases I've encountered in this study, it occurs 
to me to translate more literally as crisis of possession. This crisis can be interpreted in two ways. The first does have to do with an episode, that of an actual ritual event. The point is that while the afflicted person is understood to be possessed on an ongoing basis, the possession is often openly manifest only during the performance of the exorcism ritual. In this respect, the ritual setting is a crisis of possession, or a moment of the possession in crisis, that crisis being the enactment of a kind of theater of agency. A second sense of the crisis of possession is evident with the woman whose experience I just described, in which the entire course of ritual treatment constituted what amounts to an existential crisis. Given that the seven years of exorcism had many discrete episodes of gradually diminishing intensity that indicated therapeutic success, the real crisis of possession was the compromise with patriarchal authority that she described as an incitement to intellectual suicide. Finally, I might add that problematizing the agency of women who either seek relief with willingness or submit to ritual intervention with docility, the agency of possessing demons and the agency of exorcists through their prayers of liberation, the senior scenario of contemporary Catholic exorcism invites the question of whether the patriarchal system itself produces the specific forms of suffering it then attempts to ritually alleviate through carefully devised ritual means. I don't want to claim that all psychological anthropology in the 21st century should look like these studies, but I do present them as examples of 21st century anthropology concerned with understanding experiential immediacy and the structure of subjectivity from a phenomenological perspective. Your version of Israeli psychological anthropology will be distinctly your own, and I'm both exceptionally pleased to have participated in its inauguration and extremely eager to observe how it develops and flourishes. Thank you. So it, it's got to be a coincidence that all three questions came from people with whom I'm, I'm personally acquainted. I, they, they weren't planted. This wasn't, wasn't planned in advance. Um, so first, Don, um, I, I think that your question comes, has to come specifically out of the way you personally define psychology and the, psycholo the psychological in terms of depth. Right? So if it doesn't have to do with depth, then it doesn't qualify as being part of the, of the psychological. Um, I think that um, I don't know that I would um, make the same kind of distinction between the psychological having to do with depth and experience having to do with a more horizontal kind of um, dimension. Um, I think that experience is, is fundamentally uh, psych psychological, and experience can be, um, you know, the immediacy of experience um, is something that happens in, in a temporal moment, um, but its meaning and, and um, its profundity, um, I think, cannot be relegated to that kind of horizontal dimension. So, um, I'm uncomfortable with your question because of its predication on the notion of psychological as something that has to do with depth. And I would have to come back and answer, well, what kind of depth do you mean? And, uh, and how deep does that depth go? Huh? Um, in terms of Carol's question, so the, the presence of morality in one and not in the other um, instance that I gave is, I think, because the place of morality, uh, because I was, I was trying to, to approach each of these instances um, at um, a similar experiential level. Um, and the role of pointing out that in the case of the, um, the adolescents who are afflicted with psychiatric um, disorder, 
part of the purpose of emphasizing anger as a moral emotion is to have an alternative or to be able to step back a little bit from um, the tendency to simply define anger as a symptom. Right? And so that's where the morality comes in there. It's not, anger is not simply a symptom of, of illness. Even in cases where it's extreme like this, even in cases where it's pathological, it, it has um, a, a meaningful, purposive, moral uh, dimension. Um, the, the way morality would come into the case of um, demonic possession um, is via um, the concept of sin. Um, because um, because one in, in, within this cultural system it is presumed that one can open oneself to demonic influence um, by, by sin. Right? Uh, for example, I was surprised to find out exorcists and, and their patients talked about cursing a lot. And I was wondering what cursing has to do with the devil uh, because cursing is you know, one person wishing evil upon another. Um, and that's clearly moral. Well, in fact, the way they think about it is that when one puts a curse on someone else, that makes one, that, that cursed person vulnerable, um, including vulnerable to demonic influence. But the person who places the curse also becomes vulnerable to demonic influence because to do so is a sin. It's harming someone else. It's, it's a form of, of, of destruction. So there is a moral element um, in that respect as well. And then in, 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 a, in a large sense, um, there is um, the idea that in a way um, the whole religious structure, the whole system, um, if, you, if you were to interpret it as a system of um, patriarchal oppression, well, there is a moral dimension uh, based on that premise that, um, that the affliction itself um, has a moral dimension because of the immorality of the system. Right? Um, I'm not willing to go quite that far with, a, uh, with that interpretation. But I would say that there, within the system of exorcism, um, there is um, a recognition that at times there can be a form of spiritual abuse when the exorcistic practice becomes too intense um, or, or too rough, for example, um, that um, people are being um, uh, abused because of their spiritual uh, conditions by being put through such, such a grueling uh, ritual. Um, I don't know where um, these particular angles, uh, these particular <coughs> examples um, would fit in the current contemporary um, wave of interest in, in morality within anthropology. Um, and, and probably by the time I figure that out, the wave will have passed. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, and um, so, in, in, and finally, in terms of CP's comment about embodiment um, um, as, form, as forms of rationality or embodied forms of, of ras rationality, um, uh, part of um, part of what we're, what we're finding in bodily experience or what can be extracted from bodily experience is, uh, is, is, a, is a cultural logic, really. I mean, and that, to the extent that any logic is a form of rationality, um, one can extract this um, rationality from the bodily experience. There is, um, in a phrase that I can't get out of my head right now, um, a kind of somatic semiotic of demonic diagnostics um, that one can, you know, elaborate from this. That's a kind of embodied form of um, rationality.